The year was 2010. CGI animation had for the most part become the standard for theatrical animation. Disney had released their final 2D film in 2009 and Pixar was very much on its way out of its classic era of movies. With this new decade, it was a time of new talent to enter the industry. There were many films made in the 2000s that many of us consider classics. I mean, 2009 was an amazing year for animation as a whole. And as I said, so many classic Pixar movies were made in this time. But today's video is about a little animation company that was about to open its doors. A company many of us consider infamous. This company was built on the philosophy of spending as little money as possible to make a good family film. This animation studio is called... Illumination Entertainment. What is Illumination? Well, for one, you probably know that they are an animation studio. A very infamous one, I may add. Founded in 2007 by Chris Melodondry, the main idea was to make an animation company that could produce movies as cheaply and as marketable as possible. Since then, they have made 13 animated features, and that is counting the new Mario movie that just came out. These guys are huge. A multi-billion dollar corporation. They got merchandising, theme park stuff, you name it. This is big money in the industry. Comparable to Disney or Pixar, they are up there as one of the major animation companies. And over the years, Illumination has built quite a bit of a reputation for being very... cheap. Vip? No. Despicable Me Fart Gun. Yeah, we're gonna be talking about the company that made these things today. The Minions. I saw Despicable Me in theaters when I was around 6 or 7, so I've seen firsthand this company grow over the years. And over the years, I've heard it all. Illumination's garbage, Illumination's demeaning to kids' entertainment, Illumination's destroying the animation industry as we know it. I'm like 50-50 on if that last one is true or not. It's very apparent that this company does not have the artistic credibility the likes of DreamWorks or Pixar. Pixar has always been the animation company we expect the best out of. They are the top tier. If they make a bad movie, you will know. Then there's DreamWorks, a company that was built off the spite of Disney, and for better or worse, they've had plenty of hits while still having plenty of misses as well. But they still have a great artistic credibility going in. Most of the time, anyway. Illumination is sort of bottom of the barrel when it comes to theatrical animated movies. The least is expected out of these movies. Profits are put over everything. Now saying all of this, why are these movies so bad? What makes an Illumination movie bad? How did they get to having the reputation they have? Well, I just sat here for a whole week tolerant watching all of these, and I came out with a realization that I find really interesting. We're mainly going to be talking about the movies that stand out to me specifically, the stuff I find interesting. The movies I find were the most influential for their company. And I think the best way to start this is to talk about their first film. Let's talk about Illumination's first movie, Despicable Me. It's kind of surreal watching this movie knowing what the company would become after this. You had a good thing going there, Illumination. Why'd you fuck it up? Despicable Me is about an evil genius who wants to be the greatest supervillain in the world. How he goes about doing this is by stealing the moon. To steal the moon, he has to steal a shrink ray, and in the process of doing that, he adopts three little girls. Over time, throughout the movie, he starts to begin to grow fond of the girls. It ends up being a situation of whether or not he wants to keep his dream of being a supervillain or keep the girls and be their father. It's a really charming movie. The relationship Gru has with the girls is really charming. Despicable Me adopts the mindset of a Pixar movie. Keep the focus on the characters, have the emotional beats hit, accompanied with good writing. I'd say all the movie's emotional beats hit, and writing-wise, it's pretty good. Again, there's a charm to it I really like. Look, Mom, I made a real rocket based on the macaroni prototype. <gasps> eh. The whole plotting to steal the moon while Gru has these kids to deal with, it's kind of silly. The minions which were introduced to the world in this movie aren't really that annoying. I find the minions much more charming in this movie as their usage is kept to a minimum. There's only one scene that gets a bit out there, kind of like a precursor to later movies. To be fair, it's short, but man, this is genuinely scary. This movie is funny. We can't talk about this movie without talking about Vector. Vector! That's me, because I'm committing crimes. 
with both direction and magnitude. Oh yeah! I believe in most movies there are two ways of doing a villain correctly. One, make him interesting, sympathetic, or just a fun, evil character. Number two, just make him funny and serve his role. Oh, look at you, a little tiny toilet for a little tiny baby to- ah! Vector is number two. There's a plot point about someone stealing a pyramid at the beginning of the movie. This is actually used as a way to segue into Guru discussing his moon plans. So anyway, it's revealed that Vector is the one who steals the pyramid, so we're probably wondering, where does a man like Vector keep such an object? Surely such a huge monument would take an amazing amount of work to hide from the public. Probably need like some kind of underground base or maybe an island or something. He just keeps it in his backyard. In his fucking backyard. It's painted blue, and he keeps it in his backyard. That's it, this movie's amazing! Can I drink this? Do you want to explode? <laughs> anyway, all of this aside, it was such an endearing movie and it was a very good start for their first film. Not many animation studios get this good of a start on their first movie. It basically kickstarted Illumination to high production. It was with this, Illumination had begun. Things seemed really great, we had a new contender for the animation industry, and they made a good film, so everyone was really excited to see what they would make next. Then they made Hop. Okay, I'm gonna be for real. Shame on me, because I didn't actually watch this movie for this video because I mainly want to focus on the animated movies. But it's Illumination's lowest grossing movie. I've heard nothing good about this movie. It's not really remembered for anything other than being a bland movie. And seriously, whose idea was it to make a movie about Easter? Does anyone actually watch this year after year? I don't know. Instead of looking at this movie, I want to look at Illumination's next movie. One I find infinitely much more interesting. The Lorax. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. <clears throat> I am the Clorox. I speak for the bleach. Oh, yeah, baby. We're at the Lorax part of the video. Let's go. This movie is an amazing travesty. I think it's common knowledge that Dr. Seuss adaptations aren't very good. Except for Green Eggs and Ham, of course. That's, that one is God tier. I find the failure of this one much more interesting than the others, though. Let's look back first. In the book or cartoon from the 70s, it's a story of corporate greed. A very good story about taking care of the planet. It's a very simple story and it has a very good message. One would consider it Dr. Seuss's best work. So how did they fuck it up? I don't think there's much I'm adding that the internet has already said about this movie. With all the let it grow and how bad can I be memes. Illumination destroys the entire message the original story had. This song disturbs me. This parking lot fundamentally does not work. As they say at the beginning of the movie, Plastic and fake. They introduce this idea of, in this society, the world is so polluted to a point of where they have to buy clean air from a corporate businessman because all the air left in the world is polluted. So we buy it fresh. It comes out this machine. You know, I have an easier time believing the book's world as that was meant to be a simple story with a simple message. It's all symbolical for a bigger meaning. When you start adding on to that with world building, you start to raise questions. What happens when people can't afford air? What kind of society is this? How do people make money to buy the air? What is the class system? Is this a dictatorship? I mean, this guy's clearly a pimp. This guy's a pervert. How much is the air, huh? What do they eat? Jello. Ah, that makes sense. What is this, Ohio? And think about this, we do end up seeing the outside world and all its polluted destruction, but why not show that inside the town? Make the movie look dystopian because this is already a very dystopian idea. Make the people who live here very blindly ignorant of what is very clearly a terrible world they live in. Anyway, besides the whole world building thing, instead it's about a young boy who's probably underage, he wants to date this girl who is probably way too old for him, he wants to impress this girl by getting her a tree, and so he goes to the Wunzler to hear the story and get a tree. And he goes there on his ball bike. A ba ball bike. His, his ball bike. His gas polluting, probably, a uh, ball bike. What, 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 what is this thing? So his granny tells him about the one slur, and yeah, that makes sense. And he goes there to get a tree for his love interest. I swear, I hate our supposed main character in this movie. The entire motivation comes from selfishness and greed in a story about caring for the environment. 
Also, might as well mention, since this movie is technically a musical, only one of these songs is about caring for the environment. Let's talk about the Onceler. In the books, they never show the Onceler's face. It's a message of this can happen to anyone. Anyone can go down that path of corporate greed. I think that's a very clever way of conveying their message in the original story. So anyway, they show his face. Then it all started a long, long time ago. You had one job, Illumination. One fucking job. You lost me. They wanted to make the Onceler relatable. They did this so they could get the lesson of the story to appeal to everyone. Even though the other way worked fine. I mean, I guess I can kind of see what they were going for with this. Might as well take some liberties, this is a very short story. It doesn't work. They mistakenly appealed to a very specific demographic. They made the Onceler a Tumblr sexy man. How they turned a mysterious corporate horrible old man into a fucking hipster. This is amazing. Do I find the Onceler hot? I mean, yeah, I'd fuck it. What the fuck is this movie?! You fucked up on world building, you fucked up on the characters, and even though the Lorax is voiced by Danny DeVito, the god himself, I hate him. He's terrible. That's my character! I'm the trash man! He literally invades his house and does whatever he wants. The whole point of the book was that things are terrible. If we don't take care of the planet, nothing will get better. Don't give me this perfect society bullshit. Show the world being terrible. Every single character in this movie is stupid. How brain dead are you people? This child is glowing. Of course things aren't good. Why would you side with the air selling capitalist when your son is glowing? Another thing, you gave us an ending that just screwed up the entire point of the book. The book didn't really have a good ending. It was bleak. That was the message. Oh, what's that? Based on the book by Dr. Seuss? Let me just fix that. Alright, listen, I hate this movie, and it's a hilarious travesty, but this movie intrigues me because of the interesting production. There's a total of seven cut songs, and most of them are hit or miss, but there's three that really intrigue me. The original cut version of the opening song, Thneedville, paints a very different picture of what this world would have looked like. Can't see the sun, a town filled with pollution and chemicals flowing. Honestly, this kind of explains the kid glowing line. And the kid character was portrayed as wanting things. Maybe they were planning on making him much more selfish, and through the story he would grow into a better person learning about the Onceler's past. It's such an interesting characterization. Same thing with the Onceler and his songs. All the songs about the Onceler portray him as a character that went from loving nature to a corporate horrible businessman. There's a song all about how he loves nature, it's cursed. I love nature so dang much. Sounds like a Rayman song, I like it. And my theory is that it all would have led into what people consider the greatest cut song of any movie, Biggering. It's a dark song. It's huge and theatrical. Imagine if we had this movie. What I imagine is that this movie would have been a heavy character journey. A story of warning, all building up to this final big song. I'm not the only one who sees this, right? It's so insanely interesting to me. I mean, there is concept art for this stuff. All of this combined, it explains a lot of the questionable changes they made in the movie. There was actual thought and passion put into this, and they didn't go with it. Why didn't they go with it? Well, that's not a hard question to answer. I mean, listen to Biggering, it's a dark song. There's a line that says this. Why would a corporate, money-first company make a movie about caring for the planet? This is Illumination we're talking about. This was when Illumination was still trying to figure out their formula. They do a lot of things in this movie to pan out time. Filler, one may call it. And the whole reason they chose to make a Lorax movie in the first place was because it was marketable. I mean, look at some of these terrible advertisements. The most outrageous being that car commercial. Go ahead, drive your air-polluting car. It's Lorax approved. Can someone please explain to me how there is nothing wrong with this? Illumination doesn't like taking risks. They want nothing but the guaranteed profit. And to be fair, yeah, it paid off in the end. They succeeded at this, but at what cost? I saw the Lorax in theaters when I was a kid. After that, I got it on DVD a while later, and I never really thought about it ever again. 
And believe me when I say this, this movie did not stick with me as I got older. It was not memorable. Until... Uh, yeah, these movies have been memed to death. You know what? I'll make my own meme. Watch. Nah. <laughs> I say let it die. Let it die, let it die. Let it shrivel up and... Come on, who's with me, huh? Let, let it, it die, die, let it die. die. Let, let it shrivel up and... Let it die, die. let it die. die. Let, let it shrivel up and... Let it die, let it die. die. Let it shrivel up and... It's a woman! Overall, Illumination's second animated movie destroys the source material, makes me question humanity, and does not make me want to plant trees. The movie was a success, but damn was it forgettable! And it's honestly what started the reputation Illumination has. Low quality animated movies. Well, I'm not saying their animation isn't good. Some of these films look very nice. It's just everything else I hate. Of course, saying this again, in my opinion, this was before Illumination had their formula set. The Lorax was a fun travesty, but I want to talk about when Illumination started to perfect their little art form they were figuring out. Illumination is known for making mediocre movies. And I think the best example of this was with Minions. Let's talk about when Illumination finally found their formula. What makes an animation studio's magnum opus? A magnum opus usually means the most important work of someone or group. It doesn't mean the best thing a company made. Think of it as a movie that represents the company as a whole, what kind of stories they tell. It doesn't mean it has to be good. Everything about Illumination can be tied back to this movie. The way it's made, it was the beginning of their formula. In a way, this is Illumination's ultimate challenge. How do you make a movie about the minions, characters that speak a fake language, and make a story out of it for a theatrical feature? How do you stretch out a story like that for half an hour? You see, that's the thing you don't. The Minions is a prequel to Despicable Me. It's an origin story of the Minions and sets up a lot of lore for the characters. The Minions are these organisms that live to serve an evil boss. And so they are on a quest to find their new boss. Fun idea, but my hopes are immediately gone. It's a lot of filler. Yeah, this movie drags. There are so many scenes that have nothing to do with the movie. Which honestly makes sense as we are stretching out these one note nothing characters into a movie. See, this is why I call it their ultimate challenge. Filler is what Illumination's best at. This was the first movie that I think they mastered it, for better or worse. There's just nothing happening, it's all fucking filler! Get to the point, please! So they meet this dumbass Scarlet Overkill, who is played up as the ultimate biggest villain in the world, and she's a girl, holy fuck. She's a dumbass. The most pointless, bare-bones villain character I've ever seen. Scarlet Overkill! Evil. So evil. She makes the minions steal the queen's crown because she wants it, she evil bruh. Then the minions steal the crown. One of them pulls out the sword and the stone and now he's the king. And so they succeed. They have the crown, so you'd expect Scarlet to be happy, right? No, she pissed, I guess. <laughs> Why are you angry? They did what you asked! They gave you authority! Why are you so stupid?! I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but I hate you. This movie is just things happening. It's very bad. It's nothing but constant absurd filler. And do I even need to go in on why it's like that? Oh, uh, welcome to Hangtown. Population, you! <laughs> in Despicable Me 2, the lean virus, there was a heavy amount of focus on the minions in that movie. To be fair, they played a key role in the plot, but that doesn't really excuse it. They are fucking insufferable in that movie. And marketable. Let's abuse that. <laughs> <laughs> And so, that's what The Minions is. 24-7 constant nonsense somehow turned into a story. It doesn't work. It's just constant inconveniences and misunderstandings, it's absurd! Now despite what I've said, I need to make another point. I do actually have a few positive things to say about this movie. This movie is terrible, but it has good ideas and fun jokes. The whole opening of the movie is really creative. Like I explained before, this movie sets up the new lore to The Minions, how they require a boss. 
they live to work for someone evil. So basically, the opening is a montage of the minions just killing all their bosses over the years. It's hilarious. This just proves that the minions work so much better in short films, which they have done on multiple occasions. This could have easily just been a short film. It's honestly really funny. This raises questions though. Where were the minions in the 1940s, huh? What were they doing in the 1940s? Surely there was someone they could have worked for that- No, 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 they, they were in the ice caves, guys. They weren't working for anyone. Napoleon was just real pissed off at them, so they had to hide until the 60s, you know? It's fine. It's fine. Ignoring that, on their journey, they meet this evil family, and this is the most interesting idea this movie throws out there. I wish this movie was more about this evil family. This family is infinitely more interesting than these marketable skin demons. Why not make it, like, in-universe and have the minions show up in the background? I want this movie. Give me this illumination. Make a double spin-off with a spin-off or something, I don't know. This movie has some really funny jokes. Sorry, but I'm not looking for any more servants. For I, Professor Flux, have invented the world's first time machine. Every time I visit the future, I bring my future self back to help me. As you can see, I don't need any help. <laughs> Oh, way to go, guys. We killed the original! <laughs> I enjoy the scene where they try to mutilate the minions horribly. Also, British people. I guess I kind of like Scarlet's design. They do a few creative things with the dress, but it's ugly, which is a thing for Illumination designs. She and her husband have a very healthy relationship. Uh, This movie just pisses me off, okay? I want this movie with the evil family, not Minion Fuckwad Adventure 2000. No, we gotta have funny Minion movie that breaks 1 billion in the box office. I am dead serious, they actually made that much money on this movie. This movie literally sets a status quo for Illumination going forward after this. Yeah, the reason I'm saying this is their magnum opus is because it marks when Illumination finally got their formula. Half-baked plot, add as much filler as possible to drag out in half an hour, as many neat ideas as possible, and away we go. Good ideas, but we never go all the way with them. See, this is my problem with Rise of Gru. Fun ideas, but lack in execution. <laughs> and of course, sequels galore. Even when Illumination made original films, they rely heavily on relatability and universal liking. Let's make a movie about dogs and steal the plot of Toy Story. Let's make a franchise about an evil supervillain and not make him evil. He's not really despicable anymore, is he? The charm of the family aspect really wears off as well. He had one good scene in Despicable Me 3. But with all my criticisms, Illumination knows what they are doing. These movies do not alienate any audiences. They are made to massively appeal to the general audience. They've done this so many times. It is their own art form and they have mastered it. I mean, look at the marketing for Rise of Gru. They made fun of NFTs. This is objectively funny. Now, there's no inherent problem with making movies this way. Mass appeal is very good for a movie. But it's just the way Illumination goes about doing it. Like I said, they have a formula they have perfected. And for better or worse, that formula isn't very good at making memorable movies. I saw Despicable Me and The Lorax in theaters when they came out, and I remember Despicable Me way more than The Lorax. The reason people still remember Despicable Me is because it's just a good movie. Looking at it, it's fundamentally a very different movie compared to Illumination's other movies. It has emotional beats and moments where it slows down. You don't see that in other Illumination movies. And even when they do have the chance to do these slower moments, they choose not to. Memes can definitely have an impact on this stuff, for better or worse. I mean, that's kind of what the NFT thing was. Boy, didn't you hear me? I said, turn it, Johnny. Don't you know I'm still standing better than I ever did? Looking like a true survivor. Johnny. I'm feeling like a little kid. <laughs> Mass appeal is great, but surely you can make a good movie with it, right? So now we have finally made it to the thing I want to talk about. There is one movie I want to talk about that showcases this situation best. The movie I want to talk about is Sing. Yeah! I am so divisive with this movie. In my opinion, it's Illumination at its worst. 
It has all the illumination bugs in it. Half-baked premise, neat ideas, and filler. This is actually one of the higher looked on movies they've made. People actually really like this one. Sing is the most wide appeal movie Illumination has ever made. This movie is about a koala who loves theater. And he owns this theater that his dad bought from years ago and throughout the movie they show us that it has definitely seen better days. The movie opens up showing us those better days. The bank is on the verge of repossessing the property, so he decides to host a singing competition with a prize money award of $1,000. But after their assistant mistakenly makes $100,000, loads of people start showing up thinking they'll be rich. Now what kind of story can you tell with this premise? In my opinion, a very characterized one. There are many characters that show up in this movie. Now how does that make this a wide appeal movie? You see, it has to do with this thing called relatability. How did I end up with a son like you, hey? Eh? You're nothing like me. You never were, and you never oh, will. Oh wow! That is relatable! Remind you of any other movie? Every character in this movie is made to be relatable in some way. You got the housewife who isn't respected, the guitarist in the bad relationship, the shy elven who has stage fright. These characters are all fundamentally designed to be relatable. However, they are also really cliched. Now, I don't have a problem with cliches unless some kind of interest can be brought to the character. That's what makes it not a cliche. But they don't do that, though. They really don't. There's only two characters in the movie I think got a little bit fleshed out, and that's the monkey and the koala. But even then, it's very little. This causes me to not really care for anyone. Except for the monkey, of course. If there was a true winner for the competition, he would have been the winner. It's just so much lost potential. Like, the Seth MacFarlane mouse is an asshole. Does he face consequences of borrowing all that money and pissing off the the, the, the... the bear mafia? I mean, yeah, he does, but it's not really concluded. The money thing doesn't actually ever come back now that I'm thinking about it. And he doesn't really go through an arc, either. I mean, he sort of does, but can you really call this an arc? He doesn't really show up in the sequel, either, so we are to assume he's dead. It feels incomplete. The whole movie has problems like this. There's not enough time spent on each character, and to be fair, if they were going to give time to each and every character, this movie would probably end up being very long, so it just doesn't feel like a complete movie. Now all of this together, why did they make each character like this? Well, that's because it's marketable. Why do you think shows like The Loud House are successful? General audiences love this shit. I don't know how you would relate with this, but sure, I guess. People will latch onto this stuff because they relate with it. And that's not just the only thing this movie does to do that. It's called Sing for a Reason. A pretty big portion of the movie's budget went towards the music. Now, I'm not one to judge a person's music taste, but this stuff's just not for me. But it is for the general audience! People will see these songs in the trailers and think, Hey, I recognize that, let's go see it! This is also a good reason why Illumination uses so many pop songs in their movies. I mean, it's literally happened to me. I've seen movie trailers do this and pique my interest. It's all wide appeal. Every major decision this movie takes is in favor of being marketable. The animal character designs, the movie being about music, and again, the characters! It's all marketable! <laughs> This is why I'm so divisive with this movie, because there's things in it I really like. I want to like this movie, I really do. I mean, I love the monkey character, I love the final performance they do, I love this cover of I'm Still Standing. But without a doubt, all these decisions create a very successful movie. It's safe. But like I said, creating a movie this way makes a very forgettable experience. Especially when all the major decisions were made for marketing purposes. I mean, sure, at the time we had a lot of fun, but looking back, there's... Not much substance with it. You mean to tell me you look back on this as peak defining movie instead of, heh, that's cute. It doesn't work, and that's how I would end this segment. However... This is the first frame you see, what the fu- Sing got a sequel. How did it get a sequel? Well, we're talking about the company that made this, of course they made a sequel. Compared to the first movie, I have a little bit of an easier time liking this one. Sure, there are problems I have with it, like not explaining or going more into the famous guitar guy and his passed away wife, the producer's daughter just being okay with helping the main cast so suddenly, fundamental problems, yes. But a number of problems I have with the first movie is actually kind of touched on this time. It's actually a little bit endearing this time around. It still has a lot of the illumination bugs, yes, but it feels like they were more passionate with this one. 
I actually find myself sort of caring for the characters this time, and the villain was acceptable. It actually makes sense for him to be a wolf. Overall, I like the movie. The build-up to their final performance is way better in this one. There are some qualities to this movie I actually really like. And it's not perfect by any means, or an amazing movie by any means, but it's a good, feel-good movie. It's fun. I'm sure years from now I'm gonna look back on it and hate it, but let me just enjoy things, man. <laughs> Overall, Illumination knows how to make money on these movies. Peak general audience appeal, simple bare-bones idea for a movie, sequels and pre-existing ideas. There will be some cool ideas along the way, but most of the time you're just getting a very mid-movie. Thinking about it though, these movies are just there, you know? This company has been around since 2007. They made a billion dollars on only their fourth movie. These movies are bad, but there's fundamentally nothing wrong with liking them. Illumination isn't just some bargain bin crime against nature company. These movies are very clearly big budget, and it's not bad animation. It's a company that knows what it's doing, and that's really how I would end this video. Except, something really cool happened. The Super Mario Bros. movie. I can remember as early as four years ago we were hearing talks of Illumination making a Mario movie. Years we've been waiting for this, and even from the start, I don't think anyone expected much from Illumination making it. But what we got was something with a lot of quality put into it. I'm serious when I say this, no one had any high hopes for this movie at all, especially when the voice cast was announced. Seth Rogen is Donkey Kong? Bro, you can't make this shit up. He did a Seth Rogen laugh! <laughs> As I make this video, the Mario movie had only recently just hit theaters and it's already made loads of money, and I mean record-breaking amounts of money for an animated feature. Like, this is industry-impacting levels of big. It would make sense to expect more video game movies coming in the future. It's huge, and honestly, while we're at it, I might as well give my thoughts on the Mario movie spoiler-free, of course. It's a magnificent movie. As far as animation goes, it almost doesn't look like an Illumination movie. It's the most beautiful movie they've ever made. I personally think it definitely could have gone further in places, of course. I won't say specifically because spoilers, but even then, it's an amazing video game movie. There's not a single video game movie that captures the exact energy and passion as the video game is adapting quite like Mario. It's a perfect video game movie, filled with so many references and easter eggs, so many songs reorchestrated for the movie. In short, it's very good, and I'm so happy it was made. Now going off of that, what does this mean for Illumination going forward? Well, honestly, I think this might be the beginning of something. And honestly, in my opinion, talking about Sing 2 and their previous film Rise of Gru, I think their movies aren't as bad as they used to be. Still mediocre, of course, yes, but I'm probably very wrong saying this. It's very wishful thinking, but maybe the Mario movie impacted Illumination in a way. Maybe there's something to look forward to with their future films. I mean, without a doubt, if Nintendo wants there to be another Mario movie, I can see it already. I don't know, it's wishful thinking, yes, but maybe, just maybe. Immediately after the Mario movie released, and I mean literally the day of, they released a trailer for their next movie. Unlike their other movies, this trailer doesn't really show much. It's called Migration, and I don't know. It has a popular song in it, as it is tradition for these movies, but it does that thing where they say, made by people who made this at the beginning, reminds me of the trailer for Wally. -E. Okay, terrible comparison, I know. For all we know, this is probably gonna be another mass appeal, bare minimum movie, but who knows? I wanna keep faith. It's been a while since Illumination made an original film. Illumination as we know it is that animation company. The one that puts profits over everything. The one you see idiots like me complain constantly about online. Did Illumination destroy the animation industry? Well, I don't think so. Just because there's one bad movie doesn't mean there isn't going to be a good one later. And I mean, sometimes we do have some of those really bad moments. But just look at some of these movies that have been made in the last couple of years. Spider-Verse, Puss in Boots The Last Wish, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Even Pixar's been able to sometimes pull out a few bangers here and there in recent years. For every Spider-Verse, you're going to have a Minions, and that's okay. Given the choice of one of those Crime Against Nature movies or an Illumination movie, I would choose the Illumination movie. And maybe, just maybe, their next film will be different. Again, it's wishful thinking, but I want to hope. They've more than proved they are a confident animation studio, so maybe. I will wait for this one to hit theaters, and I will see it. Prove me right, Illumination. Show me you can make a good original film. Now, if you all excuse me, I've tainted my mind enough with these movies. I'm gonna go watch Ratatouille. 
gonna go post some minion memes on Facebook. Thank you so much for watching.